I'll just use this. Hey everyone, welcome to the Trident stage, ETH Denver 2024. Um, I'd like to welcome to the stage Ellie Ben Sasson. He's the co-founder and CEO of Starkware. The talk is titled Fry versus KZG. Does field size matter? Thank you. So um, I'll talk about this topic. Um, and the TLDR is that already today, Starks dominate the Ethereum scaling scene. And uh, thanks to recent breakthroughs, like Circle Starks and Stu, which we just open sourced yesterday, um, Starks are going to become the new gold standard for scaling Ethereum. Um, so yesterday, we released um, the next phase in scaling. Uh, in validity proof technology. It is uh, Stu based on the Mersenne 31 bit field with an improved Cairo virtual machine based on the mathematical breakthrough of Circle Stark that was published just last week, joint work by Polygon Zero and Starkware. I'm um, going to use uh, GKRA lookup and mixed degree trace and a lot of other bells and whistles, making it yet again uh, a pretty darn good prover. And uh, if you think about the landscape today in terms of proving technology, there are roughly, uh, for things deployed in production, not, not just for things that are out there in academic research, so there are roughly three categories of commitment schemes. Um, Fry-based, uh, which uh, most of the Stark systems lie in, um, inner product arguments like bulletproofs, and then you have KZGs um, used by um, things like Plonk, Roth16, and um, a bunch of teams. And over time, I mean, it used to be that KZG dominated almost everything in the ZK and scalability space, but over time, Fry-based systems have been emerging. And to get, basically, my point is, I think you'll see this trend of moving more towards Fry-based uh, Starks uh, as time goes on. And why is this so? So you could uh, consider the efficiency of one of the main bottlenecks in constructing a proof, which is to do a polynomial commitment scheme. And we can do a head-to-head -head, uh, kind of competition uh, measuring the number of clock cycles to commit to a word, a word being 32 bits, inside a stream of length roughly one uh, mega word. So two to the 20 words, that's roughly a million words. And now we can measure the load um, in the commitment scheme for per each word. And let's uh, c um, compare Fry and KZG. So this is based on some, some comparisons that I already presented in the past, both at uh, Stark at Home and at the Stanford Blockchain Conference uh, earlier, I mean, this past summer. So the current um, status is that if you look at uh, non-vectorized uh, instruction sets, so KZG under the even most ideal algorithms that we know of today, you're going to have to do roughly a cost of a word length. So that's 32 divided by the logarithm of the stream. In our case, it's 20. So 32 divided by 20. Number of group operations. Each group operations at best, and you have to do a lot of uh, fancy work to make that work, uh, you need to do six modular multiplications for doing elliptic curve uh, operation. And each one of those roughly costs uh, 32, uh, sorry, 38 uh, to 40 clock cycles. On the other hand, if you look at something like 32, 31-bit uh, uh, fry, um, you'll see that you pay for the FFT roughly one half of the blow-up factor times uh, logarithm times 20. In our case, the blow-up factor is uh, is going to be two, so half times two times 20 t uh, equals 10. And that's the number of clock cycles per word, plus blow up factor times hash. So if you use something like uh, Blake, that's going to be 80 clock cycles. You see the most dominating factor here is going to be the hashes, and you have to pay two of them. So out of the 220 cycles, 160 belong to the hashing. However, if you move to um, vectorized instruction sets, which are today common in all uh, CPUs, um, then the ch picture changes pretty drastically because KZG probably doesn't vectorize all that well, whereas uh, um, something like a 31-bit 
field fry with an FFT does vectorize extremely well. And then you get that uh, each modular mul multiplication in the small field is one third of a clock cycle amortized. So you get a total of 31 clock cycles versus something that is probably going to be around 10 times greater than that. So you have like 10 times greater efficiency, but the story doesn't end there. Um, sorry. Um, in practice, when everything is combined, if you look at the Frybay system, um, to best of my knowledge, this is along uh, some of the world records, even though it's like four years old. So we already showed four years ago um, a construction over a 64-bit field that proves 100,000 rescue hashes in less than 10 seconds on a quad core with 16 gigabytes RAM. And this was at the time 20 times faster than the fastest known KZG-based uh, system, SNARK. And we still don't know what is the best proving time for something similar. You know, it would be a good measurement to do head by head, take your favorite algebraic hashing function and see how long does it take to prove 100,000 iterations of a hash on some simple um, hardware. It's probably gonna, not gonna be all that simple. Anyways, um, but Fry-based systems or Starks have a bunch of other uh, advantages over uh, SNARKs. They have fastest commitment time. They're agile in the sense that they work over all finite fields from binary all the way to large prime fields. They are safest because they have no trusted setup, meaning they're transparent proof systems. Their security assumptions really revolve only around the existence of uh, some secure um, hash function. And in particular, they're also post-quantum secure. KZG does have advantages, uh, SNARKs. They have very short proof length, under 200 uh, bytes. And they have additive properties, which, well, it's a double-edged sword. You can use them for doing things like folding and compressing things, but they also, uh, this additivity is related to things like post-quantum uh, um, insecurity. So, now, this theory that, that says that um, Frybay systems over small fields are going to be better is not just something that we believe in on the mathematical or you know back of the envelope side. We're also committing ourselves to it. So for the past uh, six years, we've been using basically one prover uh, that is STONE, which stands for Stark One. It is our first uh, Stark-based proving system. And now we're moving uh, slowly towards uh, um, STU, which is the second Stark prover. And I want to tell you a little bit about this because it's uh, pretty exciting. Um, so what it's going to give you is much faster proving technology. It's going to reduce the total computation cost, um, meaning you pay less dollars for proving stuff. And it's going to have, be seamlessly integrated with StarkNet, which means if you start deploying and building in Cairo on StarkNet tomorrow, you will get all of these benefits uh, without uh, really any modification. So. Let's uh, uh, look a little bit under the hood. What is uh, what is Stu? So first of all, let's talk about the 31-bit Mersenne prime field. So a Mersenne prime has the form 2 to the k minus 1. And if you take k to be 31, you get the number 2 to the 31 minus 1. It is a prime number. And it has a lot of uh, cool properties to it. I mean, Mersenne, the great Mersenne, already found it probably a couple of hundred years ago. And it gives you, so moving to 32-bit fields in our world where all computer devices, you know, off the shelf operate in 32-bit instructions in the fastest way means that you get a lot of benefits. One, the smaller field size allows you to get your arithmetization better done because when you have large fields, you need to pack things into big field elements and it's inconvenient. Um, it fits inside a computer instruction word. And you even have uh, nice modular reductions because 2 to the 31, which in bitwise representation is just 1 with a bunch of zeros, um, happens to equal 1. So if you have, you know, if you do have the 2 to the, if you have your 32nd bit turned on, you can sort of replace that with the lowest bit turned on, and that's how you do modulus. So it's a very simple modular instruction. And there are a lot of uh, nice benefits for doing uh, fast implementations, both on CPUs and GPUs, uh, for basic field operations, such as modular addition and multiplication, for doing FFTs or NTTs, and for computing things like uh, Stark-friendly hashes like Poseidon. 
Um, one example is if you take uh, if you take two 32-bit numbers and you just concatenate them together, sorry, two 31-bit numbers, what you're looking at is literally uh, equivalent to their sum modulo um, uh, this prime. So uh, you can, concatenation, at least of two uh, such field members, does represent the addition of them. And you can do a lot of such tricks. So let me tell you a little bit about this exciting uh, breakthrough, joint work by Polygon and uh, Starkware. Um, Ulrich Habok from uh, Polygon, uh, David Levitt and Shaha Papini from our team at Starkware. Uh, really, really spectacular result. Um, so, circles start, and the circle refers to the good old circle that we all know and love. So, let's see how we get there. Um, for Starks to work best, they require a group that is of size uh, 2 to the K. We often talk about an FFT-friendly domain. And it turns out that the uh, multiplicative group, usually we take fields and work with their multiplicative groups and find subgroups inside those multiplicative groups. But for that, you, look, you have to look at the factorization of the prime minus 1. In our case, that would be 2 to the 31 minus 2. And 2 to the 31 minus 2 does not have very large factors of 2. And in fact, 2 is the largest power 2 that divides it, which means you don't have uh, the nice uh, multiplicative groups that you would like. Now, if you go to the degree 2 extension of Mersenne, you already have a very nice uh, FFT-friendly group of size uh, 2 to the 31. However, now you'll be needing to work with uh, basically 62-bit um, field elements and doing all your operations. So, and that's a bit inconvenient. We would like to get all the benefits of the Mersenne arithmetic, uh, but working only over the Mersenne field. So, one possible solution is to use um, some work that we did a few years ago um, at Starkware called uh, elliptic curve Starks, which basically replaces the group, the multiplicative group of a finite field with an elliptic curve group defined over that finite field. The nice thing that there is, a, is that there is an abundance of uh, elliptic groups um, of all sorts and, well, not of all sizes, but uh, there's a pretty large uh, variety of them within the Hasse whale bound. Uh, so you can find one that has uh, a nice subgroup of size two to the K, which is what you want. However, this would be relatively complicated. The elliptic curves are a little bit more complex than some simpler curves that we all know and love. So enter the circle curve or circle starts. They operate over the genus zero curve that is the circle defined over M31. So what does it look like? You take the good old circle, which is the set of pairs of points such that x squared plus y squared equals 1, in our case, uh, modulo the Mersenne prime. And there's a bunch of uh, examples of such number, such points on the, group, on, the, uh, on the circle. So 1, 0, uh, minus 1, 0, which in our case equals uh, 2 to the 31, minus 2. And uh, also if you take the point that is 2 to the 15, 2 to the 15, that thing, if you square each one and sum them up, you get 1 modulo the Mersenne prime. So here are a few numbers, a few points on this uh, group. And it turns out that there are exactly, well, there are 2 to the 31 groups that reside um, inside the, uh, that are, basically that are defined over the Mersenne field, meaning that the pairs X and Y, both of them belong to the Mersenne field. And it forms a group. I think actually the group is uh, of half the size, but I'm confusing myself now. So it's at least of size 2 to the 30, um, and you have a very nice uh, operation for addition. So that's the Mersenne 31 field. Uh, there's going to be a talk by uh, Shachar Samocha um, either later today or tomorrow, and by Ulrich Habok. I think it's going to be tomorrow at the Stark meetup. Um, sharing a lot more details about the math behind it and about uh, looking deeper into Stu, which is already open sourced uh, by now. So um, what are the implications? This gives you the very fastest prover using new math and uh, it's going to be crazy efficient. We believe it's going to be something like 100 times more efficient end to end than the current stone proof and the current stone prover is 
the, among the fastest proving systems end-to-end -end for production systems today. So we are extremely excited about the potential um, of Stu to go even further in scaling Ethereum. For StarkNet, what you need to know is that if you write in Cairo, you'll get all of this good goodness for free because it will just be adapted seamlessly. This will lead to lower fees and to quicker finality. Hopefully, we'll start seeing it already helping us with finality and reducing latency um, this year, in 2024. And another nice thing is that it is open source, written in Rust, and the open source is already um, open today. So you can just Google for Stu under Starkware, and you'll find it under Starkware Libs, and you can start hacking or using it. Um, so I'll repeat the TLDR. Starks dominate the Ethereum scaling sc scene already today, with more and more teams moving over to using Fry-based systems um, that are safer but also more efficient. And the recent breakthroughs of Circle Stark and Stu will become the new gold standard for scaling Ethereum, not just at StarkNet, probably also uh, in Polygon Zero, and other teams are going to adapt to them, and then we'll see a lot more in the industry. So. This is as good a time as ever. It's the second best time to start uh, looking into StarkNet in Cairo. The first best time was probably, you know, a year ago, but still we're early enough in the game. So you can take this QR code, follow the links, uh, join the ecosystem. Thank you very much.